You have to realize that even for the flu vaccine, there are still people who are vaccinated who get sick, but they don't die, you know, because of sure. the vaccine that they receive. And so maybe this is a very similar story here. We're going to have vaccines that may not completely protect you against infection, against all strains of COVID, but it may protect you against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Aloha, I'm Robert Perkinson. I'm the coordinator of the UH Better Tomorrow Speaker Series, which is a joint venture of UH, the Hawaii Community Foundation and Kamehameha Schools. And today we're going to be talking about the science behind the COVID vaccines, both those in the pipeline and especially those that have been approved and are actively being used in Hawaii. Our guest today is UH Medical School Professor Sandra Chang. She's a microbiologist and an immunologist by training. She's worked a lot in vaccine development herself for malaria and many other diseases. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Tropical Medicine, Medical Microbiology and Pharmacology, and she is the co-chair of the State Department of Health's Vaccine Medical Advisory Working Group. Um, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. So I thought that it would be useful for people to have, for those who want it, a deeper scientific understanding of mm -hmm. vaccine science generally and all of the different types of vaccines that are in the pipeline as more, you know, it's two mRNA vaccines that are approved and in use so far, mm -hmm. but others are likely to be approved. Um, before we really get into it, however, I think it's worth for a moment just reviewing what we know so far about the safety and efficacy data of the approved vaccine, uh, approved vaccines. So first, what can you tell us about safety? How is it going now that we're getting a lot of shots in arms? Yeah, so, you know, they've been continuing to monitor the safety and by they, I mean the CDC and the FDA, they have a variety of ways that they can do this. And of course, people have been concerned about anaphylaxis because that's been the most severe um, side effect that has been observed. And they've looked now um, for both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines at many more doses in arms and um, have looked at the number of cases. And so for the Pfizer vaccine, they've seen a total of about 50 cases per about 10 million first doses of the Pfizer vaccine. So that gives us a, a frequency of about five cases per million doses of anaphylaxis. Um, for Moderna, they've seen 21 cases in about seven and a half million doses administered. So less. Oh, so uh, the incidence has gone down. Yeah, 2.8 cases per million. So as they look at more, you know, um, individuals, they can get a better read of how many cases they're really seeing in the population. And it does look better, still a little higher than most other vaccines, but not tremendously higher, just slightly higher. Of course, they're monitoring very closely. As you know, people who get vaccinated are monitored for at least 15 minutes. And if they have a history of severe allergies, they are monitored for about 30 minutes after right. they receive the vaccine. And still in the United States, no fatalities associated with these incidents of no. anaphylaxis? None that um, have been, you know, there are always these anecdotal cases that come up, but when all of the cases have been followed up, they have not been able to directly attribute any deaths to the vaccines or to anaphylaxis caused by the vaccines. Yeah, so just to reinforce the basic math for people who might be worried about anaphylaxis, by contrast, um, so if, there, if the rate per million is what did you say, about five or less for the Moderna and the? Yeah, two and five, about 2.8 for Moderna and about five for Pfizer. So by contrast, if the COVID case fatality rate is say 0.5%, maybe it's a little bit lower than that. It depends on your age group. Yeah. That's 5,000 cases per million. Yeah. Um, so I do hope people do the proper comparison. 
Yes. The risk and is realize so much greater with COVID. Just yeah. like flying is safer than driving drunk, uh -huh. getting uh -huh. a COVID vaccine is a lot safer than getting COVID. It's not even close. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, what about um, efficacy? We have the, you know, the phase three trial results for the two approved uh -huh. that had greater than 90% efficacy, which is yeah. astonishingly high. Is, is, isn't that astonishingly high for a vaccine? Well, I mean, there are other vaccines that are that efficacious as well, but um, it is on the high end of the scale and certainly better than we had expected. Yeah. And is that number, to what extent are we getting data from real world mass vaccinations in terms of um, COVID transmission? They're monitoring it, but I haven't seen um, numbers, you know, in terms of percent efficacy with routine use of the vaccine. Uh, right. It's just from the clinical trials. Yeah. There's the only place I know that's closest is Israel that has oh, yes. now vaccinated the greatest portion of their population. And the cases have plummeted. Yes, that's um, right. Mm -hmm. Even despite the fact that now it's the more contagious variants that are dominating their caseloads. So that's ironically kind of double, doubly good news. Yeah. Um, hopefully they will get them to Palestinians as well. That's true. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I thought it might be helpful for people to go back in time and sort of understand a little bit about the development of vaccines. I'm. Mm -hmm. How far back does this field go? It goes back pretty far. Um, so the first practice that was similar to vaccines was a process called variolation. And that was in relation to smallpox. And this was back in the 1500s. This is and cowpox. So, smallpox. I mean, but you, they were, is this the one where they were using cowpox? No, no, not oh, yet. Okay. Not yet. Oh, so oh, what oh, they okay. were doing was they were taking pus or dried scabs from individuals with smallpox and introducing it to naive individuals who were at risk of getting smallpox. Either they were putting it in their nose, in their, the nares of their nose, or they were um, puncturing the skin and putting it on the skin. And so that's a process called variolation, pretty crude, but effective. Mm -hmm. um, and so this was happening mostly in, in Asia. Um, and then, Europeans, when they traveled to Asia, observed what was happening and it seemed to have a benefit. So this was taken back to Europe when they had their own smallpox uh, pandemic there. And they started doing the practice of variolation. Um, of course, you know, that was gradually <laughs> improved. And so um, Edward Jenner was the first uh, physician who introduced the process of vaccination. And that's where cowpox I see. comes in. Although interestingly, um, there's still some controversy as far as what the true origin of this vaccine was, because there are two diseases that are very similar, and that's cowpox and horsepox. And oh. it's possible that the uh, broadly used smallpox vaccines are actually derived from horsepox, but uh, they're, they're closely related, yeah. And so was cowpox vaccine used in mass inoculations or was polio the first where kind of everyone? No, it was used in mass. I mean, um, so smallpox inoculation was used sy systematically, I would say, to eradicate smallpox, you know. And so that is the first disease, infectious disease that has been eradi eradicated, yeah. Um, and yeah, and polio was close. It's getting there. I mean, there's still a few pockets, a few countries where they're seeing cases of polio, but um, for most, most of the world, it's been, it's disappeared for a long period of time, yeah. And the original polio vaccine was an attenuated virus vaccine? Um, so there are two types of um, polio vaccines. So there was an attenuated virus vaccine 
And then there is the inactivated virus vaccine. And so, um, you know, they're used in different ways. Um, the attenuated one is used in more, uh, in areas where there is a high level of transmission and they need to control the disease and prevent transmission. So very often they because need it's, to use- it's more effective. Yes, it's a little bit more effective, but there are dangers associated with uh, using a live vaccine in a population. Um, and so the inactivated vaccine is used in areas where you just wanna do mass inoculation and, pr and um, pr protect the population, but there is no really high risk of, of getting polio in those populations. You, know, you just wanna eradicate it. I was interested to see that there's one of the vaccines that's in trials is an attenuated no. or uh, inactivated vaccine. Not no. not one of the ones, I don't think it's phase three. It's an inactivated vaccine. Yeah. Oh, okay. There are so no what's the, what's the attenuated um, SARS vaccines in development. No live attenuated SARS vaccines in development, only inactivated. Vaccines. So inactivated and are not, tell me the difference. They're killed by chemical processes. They're just treated with chemicals um, that inactivate the virus so that it cannot replicate, but they're still able to induce an immune response that's protective. And so the one in um, China, there's a, a vaccine that's been developed in China, which is an inactivated uh, vaccine. I see. But the ones that look like they are in late stage trials now are... Um, the protein subunit vaccine is another one. Okay, so that's Novavax is the one right. that's furthest along. That's the protein subunit vaccines. And then there are the adenovirus vaccines. And those are really interesting vaccines because- Okay, tell us about those. That's like Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, John, yes, Oxford, yes. right? So those vaccines are interesting because even though they're based on the adenovirus, it is a non-replicating adenovirus. So, um, the virus carries the spike protein from the SARS vi virus. So just one protein from the SARS virus and carries the gene for that into the host cells. And then um, the cells make the spike protein, release it into circulation and you develop an immune response to the spike protein that way. That way. But the interesting thing about these viral vaccines, the adenovirus vaccines is they enter into the cell, but they do not reproduce. And so they're kind of like a Trojan the virus horse. system themselves. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. And so it's not capable of producing an infection, a viral infection in hosts. So, so it's, how as a does result, the, it's safe. Yeah. Why does why do we humans not react and kill the adenovirus before it has a chance to insert the proteins and get them in production? Well, um, for one thing it's a relatively high dose that they are administering. So while you may be inactivating part of the inoculum, um, so enough of it is getting into your cells to produce an immune response. Are they also choosing viruses the, that, are, that we tend to be naive to? Or? Yeah, they are. So one of them is a ch chimpanzee uh, form. And then the other one though is more closely related to the human um, adenoviruses. And the Sputnik vaccine is very interesting because it consists of both the chimpanzee and the other adenovirus 26, which is more closely related to the human ones. And so the idea is- So it is has two, two viruses that are entering. Two different ones, right. Interesting. And so if you develop immunity to the first one, it's not going to protect you against the second one that goes in. And so it has a better chance of inducing the immune response. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's, Is that it's a lot a pretty, more? Yeah, that's I mean, clever. Theoretically, it sounds like a better strategy. But in reality, I think, you know, both types of vaccines, both the Adeno 26 that's used twice, as well as the um, Adeno 5 and the Adeno 26 combination, they both induce a very strong immune response and pretty good efficacy. And do they require adjuvants like the no. Novavax vaccine or not? Okay, so t tell us about the protein subunit technology and how that's different okay. from those we've been discussing. So the protein subunit technology is a little bit different. Um, 
it involves formulating a protein in a way that allows it to be immunogenic to induce an immune response. And um, it does include an adjuvant. Um, the adjuvant that's used for the Novavax is their own uh, matrix M protein, which is sort of a lipid um, uh, composition adju adjuvant that enhances the immune response to the protein uh, subunit spike protein itself. And so usually when you uh, make a protein subunit vaccine, you do need to add some kind of an adjuvant. And so this is the one that is being used by Novavax. And so this one delivers the, the SARS-CoV-2 proteins directly. You're not manu it's not calling it's upon not the cell to made. do any it's production. It's already pre, yeah, pre-made, it's being injected, and then it's taken up by the cells of the immune system and presented to the immune system in a way that induces a good immune response. The fact that there are so many different approaches, and presumably these vaccines are also using different parts of the spike protein, or do they tend to no, they have homed actually, in? They're pretty much using the same spike protein because that's the sensitive target for the virus I see. Uh, that is required so, for viral entry. Yeah. So if the virus evolves to have to be vaccine resistant, it it probably, it won't matter that there's so many different vaccines targeting it. It should develop immunity to all of them, more or less? Well, you know, there's, of course, there's a lot of discussion right now about that whole issue because of the variants that have emerged already in uh, UK as well as in South Africa. And so, you know, there is a real concern that the current vaccines may not protect against these emerging viruses. And, um, you know, we don't know everything at this point in time, but so far the data seems to indicate that at least for some of the vaccines, it looks like there is good cross protection against the um, mutant forms. Now, um, you know, there may be some disease, some mild disease, uh, moderate COVID infection of individuals that are infected with the variant strains, but so far it looks like there is no severe disease, there are no hospitalizations, and no one has died who has right, been vaccinated. Right, no fatalities, right. Yeah, uh-huh. So, yeah, another, um, another amazing metric of vaccine efficacy so far, I, I read a few days ago, is that there, among vaccinated individuals, there's not been a single COVID, verified COVID fatality. Yes, uh-huh. It's pretty amazing, I mean, you know, we had no idea that it would work as well as it has. Uh, and you have to realize that even for the flu vaccine, there are still people who are vaccinated who get sick, but they don't die, you know, because of sure. the vaccine that they receive. And so maybe this is a very similar story here. We're gonna have vaccines that may not completely protect you against infection, against all strains of COVID, but mm -hmm. it may protect you against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. So is it, is it possible that this enhanced efficacy has to do with the mRNA technology? Um, but they're seeing it in, in the others multiple too. platforms, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, let's turn though to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you could sort of walk us through the development of this mRNA technology that people have been talking about and promising drugs and yeah. vaccines yeah. for some time, but this is really the first time it's being mm -hmm. successfully used. Yes? Yeah. Well, it is a relatively new technology. It's the newest technology of all that have been tested so far. Um, and so, you know, it appears to be very effective at inducing a potent immune response. Um, again, it has the advantage of being safe because what happens is uh, the messenger RNA is encap encapsulated in a lipid uh, par particle or bubble. And so this lipid particle carries the messenger RNA that encodes the spike protein into the host cells. And then it enters the cytoplasm of the host cells, but it doesn't go into the nucleus. And that's what makes it very safe because it has no... Um, mechanism for inserting into the host DNA. It remains I mean, in the like, cytoplasm. 
it's very rapidly turned over. So there's, it's just around for a few days and the host cell will make protein from that messenger RNA. It'll prime its immune response. And then eventually the messenger RNA and the protein will be cleared from the system. So one of the challenges to developing mRNA treatments was the fragility of the mRNA and figuring out how to deliver it to the cells, right? So is, so is it the lipid bubble that's as much of a breakthrough here right, as- Right, I think so, yeah. This lipid what, what nanoparticle worked this time? just protects it against. So, so the reason why it's so unstable is because in our cells, within our body, we have these um, nucleases or proteins enzymes that break down RNA very, very efficiently. And so what the lipid particle does is it protects it from those proteases, and then it fuses with the cell, releases it into the cell. Now the cell also has proteases, but there is enough time for the messenger RNA to be synthesized into protein before all of the messenger RNA is degraded. So um, yeah. That's the basis, the basis for these messenger RNA vaccines. And in terms of the challenges of the super cold temperatures, especially for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, um, is it the mRNA itself that requires super cold storage or is it the lipid nanoparticle that? Well, I think it's the combination. Um, certainly the mRNA is more stable at low temperatures, but the whole formulation is probably um, has a longer half-life at lower temperatures. Mm -hmm. And what happens if it warms up? You know, I, I haven't really thought about that, but I can imagine that, you know, the um, lipid would degrade and the messenger right. RNA would be released and be Never degraded make it into the by cells. the proteases. No. I see. Uh, um, there's... At least the last I looked at a list of ingredients, the number of ingredients in the vaccines is quite small. Yes. Um, uh -huh. But you know, nonetheless, people hesitant about putting new substances into their bodies are mm -hmm. concerned about what's in it. So what can you tell us about the other, mm -hmm. both the, you know, you've talked about the um, way that the mRNA is broken down and removed and doesn't enter the nucleus. So that's how we know there won't be any kind of genetic changes right. wrought by the vaccine. Um, the lipid nanoparticle, I guess, is also broken down and metabolized quickly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then what are the other ingredients and how common are they in other medications or vaccines? Yeah, so um, all of the components, you know, are pretty commonly found in medicines or cosmetics or other products that we get exposed to every day. Um, much of it is salts uh, that buffers the pH of the particle itself, keeps it stable. And um, we also have a number of different types of lipids that make up the na nanoparticle. And so those are the other components. And then we have the messenger RNA. Now, the lipids uh, include one particular molecule, which is called polyethylene glycol 80. And this particular one is the one that they suspect is being associated with the anaphylactic responses in a few individuals. And um, it is related to um, polysorbate, which is also uh, a molecule that they uh, want to be sure that you don't, you're not allergic to because those are two structurally similar compounds. And so um, really um, the phospholipids and the polyethylene glycol are pretty much the only other components other than salts and the messenger RNA. Okay, I have a, more and more people um, as the weeks go on will receive their vaccinations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm one of them. I've, I signed up for the BioNTech trial and I, I got unblinded the other day and found out that I, much to my relief that I did not receive a placebo. So I'm fully vaccinated, but I was kind of surprised to discover that um, the trials weren't designed to assess whether or not vaccinated individuals might still be transmitting virus. So how, 
how would that work? Why is it important? Mm -hmm. How could theoretically vaccinated people infect others if they are immune? So what, what we know, the way that the trial is performed is the readout is COVID-19 symptoms and the presence of the virus by RT-PCR. So that is what they're looking for in the vaccine trials. And so what the trials say is that if you're vaccinated, you're protected against developing a COVID-19 infection that is associated with symptoms. Mm -hmm. what, they're not, what they don't know is how many individuals are infected that don't have any symptoms at all because they weren't monitoring everyone in the clinical trial. They were only monitoring individuals with symptoms. Right. Yeah, so that's why they cannot say at this point in time whether you can be vaccinated but still release virus if you're asymptomatic. Um, but presumably one would be much less infectious at least I would imagine so. Right. I imagine that would be the case, that you would have fewer it, virus in your body. It seems to be also the, I mean, it's very preliminary, the data, but it does seem like infection rates, though they're very high, are starting to go down in areas where, um, you know, vaccines have become more prevalent. It but does again, seem to be they're working. Looking at, they're looking at symptomatic infection. They're not looking right. at asymptomatic infection. They are doing some studies um, I know of one study that's being done in uh, healthcare workers where they are monitoring individuals for asymptomatic infection who have been vaccinated. Right. And comparing and think, that to the unvaccinated population. I think they tested us for antibodies a couple of times in the trial mm -hmm. to look for past infection. It is a, I did come to appreciate just what a massive operation of phase three clinical trial is over the course of being involved in one myself. I, yeah. I had not really realized how many hundreds of millions of dollars and highly trained staff and infrastructure you need. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's being so done big. in so many different places at the same time. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing. I, it's important for people to realize, I think that these vaccines have gone through all of the regular steps. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, as they would with any, it just, it's just been expedited by A, so much COVID, and which means we get to discover efficacy faster and um, B, the fact that they started manufacturing even before they got full results, right? Right. I mean, they started manufacturing very, very early. Um, so when they first got the, um, the vaccines developed or created, I suppose you could say, and started testing it in animals, they were already trying to start the process of manufacturing clinical grade material that could be tested in humans, as well as um, developing manufacturing capacity for these vaccines. So it's a tremendous investment in resources for the companies that were developing these vaccines. And of course, this was um, supported by the government. By the government well. too, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, mm -hmm. it's, Im it's important for people to realize that the corners weren't actually cut. No. There was just a lot of money spent to speed things yeah. up. Mm -hmm. um, well, another question I had is, uh, you know, to what extent do we now have data on um, the level and the duration of immunity in vaccinated individuals versus infected individuals? Is there much comparative data that's reliable yet well, on that question? There's a little bit of data, um, you know, for the vaccines. We've only been following them for less than a year now. So it is, you know, not possible mm -hmm. for us to say exactly how long immunity will last with the vaccine, but it will last at this point in disease. time, at least, at least six months, <laughs> probably. They're right. going to be following them for two years. So we'll see in time how long immunity lasts. But in contrast for um, people who have had COVID-19, uh, when they looked at sort of a correlate of immunity, looking at antibody production in these individuals, they find that, yes, some people who get very sick make high levels of antibody that may be able to protect them against reinfection. 
But other people who have just mild cases of COVID sometimes don't make much antibody at all. So just mm -hmm. because you were infected does not mean that you are protected against reinfection. And even for it... those who have been protected for a short period of time, um, you know, those antibodies may disappear over time as well. I see. So whether you think you've had COVID or know you've had COVID or not, when you can, you should still get vaccinated, yes, in other words. definitely, definitely. Do you think it makes sense for people who've had a confirmed case of COVID to go to the back of the line or maybe receive a single shot instead of two in order to yeah. get I more think people it, vaccinated? Or? It depends on their risk. You know, if mm -hmm. you're someone with a lot of comorbid conditions, I would certainly not put it off. Um, if you're, you know, a young person, very healthy, and you feel like, you know, you could wait a little bit, well, it's your choice. You can do that as well. But you're still at risk of developing severe disease, which does happen in young people as well as older people and people with comorbidities. So let's talk, uh, we've talked some about, um, you know, the extraordinary speed, um, use of new technologies and success of this. This is really the one bright spot that we have in the pandemic, how effective and quickly the vaccines have been developed, even if they're mm -hmm. maybe not distributed as quickly or as efficiently as we would like. Um, but, you know, this basic science that's been, and what we've learned from this effort, sh should it pay dividends in other areas of vaccine um, research? Like for instance, I'm, as an, as an outsider, I find it puzzling that HIV is so difficult to vaccinate against compared to um, coronaviruses. Why is that? And, and might some of these new technologies help with older diseases or are the viruses so different that well, we're not it comparing could apples help. and apples? I mean, you know, it's possible that a messenger RNA vaccine uh, might help in case of in the case of HIV, but the problem with HIV is that immunity is very difficult to develop. You know, for people who are naturally infected with HIV, they can be reinfected. And in fact, they develop chronic infections. They don't clear the virus completely from their bodies. Mm -hmm. So in situations like this, where immunity is so difficult to achieve, even with natural exposure, it becomes even more difficult to induce by vaccination. And the other thing about HIV is that that particular virus has a very high rate of mutation. Even in a single individual, you can have many, many different variants arise over time. Mm -hmm. And so it's been you know, such a challenge to develop a HIV vaccine for those reasons. And the other reason is that the virus itself um, hides within the host cells and incorporates into your DNA. And so, you know, it has a latent form that persists for many years as well. And so it, it's a really it's tough just, nut to crack, yeah. Whereas by contrast, the coronavirus is... Um, it's an acute infection, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they it's, also have a, th these viruses have a mechanism for to slow down mutations, right? To kind of, as they're replicating, to double check they haven't made mistakes? They do have, yeah, correction mechanisms. That's right. Mm -hmm. And HIV doesn't? Well, not very effective ones, yeah. It's more error prone. How is it that some viruses don't generate any immune response at all? Um, like HIV sure. or so little that, that some viruses generate so little recognition from the immune yeah. system, like HIV and in, in, in the case of natural infections, even though you get very sick in some cases. For these um, difficult infections, very often what happens is your immune response does recognize and does produce a response, but that response is not protective. You I know, see. It's just recognizing it, but it's not harming the virus in the ways that need to be uh, done in order for it to be eliminated. Yeah. And is your, your own research has been in malaria vaccines? Yes, yes. And how is that, how is that fundamentally different or similar from the sorts of vaccine researches that we're seeing with? Well, you know, there is, a, there is a malaria vaccine right now that's being piloted in areas of the world that have high rates of malaria transmission. 
and it is partially protective against malaria infection. But um, malaria is one of those diseases that you can get many, many times within your lifetime. And, um, you know, immunity is not very um, strong or long lasting against malaria, just natural immunity. And so, and there are many different variants of the malaria parasite in circulation. So again, you know, it's similar to HIV in, in a sense that the virus has evolved and competed very successfully with the human immune system over time. I see. And so, you know, where, where do you hope we are in vaccine technology, say 20 years from now, from now? What's, you know, 20 years ago, people were talking about the promise of mRNA what are people talking about now that might be over the horizon? Yeah, I think certainly developing strategies that can identify the targets for some of these more difficult diseases is, is very important. You know, if we could just find which components of the HIV virus or the malaria uh, parasite is very vulnerable to the immune system and we can induce a response to those components. I think there's hope, but I think there's some, uh, still a lot of basic immunology that needs to be done on these infections. Mm -hmm. um, but then the other side of the coin is just because we have a COVID vaccine doesn't mean that we've reached the end of the game. You know, It's only as good as, as many people take it. And as you know, you know, if people don't get vaccinated, um, if we don't reach a level of herd immunity that protect, uh, protects the population, then these vaccines will not help us to control the infection, to reduce the number of cases and to eventually eradicate the disease. And so I think one of the biggest challenges is to achieve the level of immunity that is necessary to really end this pandemic. It's also worth pointing out, I think, that the, the more COVID is circulating globally, the more chances the exactly. virus has yeah. to mutate in way, mm -hmm. and, and every once in a while, one of those mutations is not a friendly one. That's right, that's right. Um, okay, well, let's, let's talk about the efficacy and hesitancy. Um, so I, you know, in my conversations with people, I've had questions, a lot of questions that have fallen into two categories. One about people with various pre-existing conditions like um, who are immune compromised, who have cancer. What is the advice for people who have ongoing health challenges about whether they should or shouldn't get vaccinated? Well, I think it comes down to your own personal decision about your own risk of being infected and your own risk of developing severe disease. Um, so far, even though immunocompromised individuals were not deliberately included in the trials, it does appear that they are able to make an immune response to the vaccine and be protected hopefully against the, the disease. And so, you know, I think the recommendation is that even though you may have a, uh, chronic health problem, or you may have cancer, or you may have autoimmune diseases, but there's no reason why you should not get vaccinated. Um, it's no guarantee that you'll develop a strong enough immune response to prevent infection, but it may be sufficient to protect you against severe disease and save your life. Yeah, and again, it seems like the if one compares the possible risks of the vaccine to the known risks of COVID, exactly. at least in all cases that we know of so far, COVID is entails far greater risk in, in, any, in any age group or any demographic that's yes. been mm -hmm. studied, at least as far as I know. Mm -hmm. What about groups of people who were intentionally left out of the trials? Pregnant women, lactating women, um, extremely elder, you know, very elderly individuals over the age of 90 and so on. Like, are there any, is, is the recommendation across the board that these groups too should yes. be vaccinated? I think, uh, yes, the, they are recommended to receive vaccines. For pregnant women, um, 
there's no indication that at least the vaccines that we have approved so far uh, provide any risk to the woman in terms of the pregnancy, as well as to the developing fetus. And so it's felt that, you know, pregnant individuals should be vaccinated. Um, and I think there's some preliminary, if memory serves, there's some preliminary evidence that immunity may be passed. Some, some antibodies may be passed to the infant from well, the mother as well. That's the normal situation that right. you okay. do, yeah. Have, there is placental transfer of antibody, that's right. And that would be uh -huh. true with vaccine-generated antibodies as well as? That's true, yes, yes. I see. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, are there any, did you think we would be here? A, it's almost a year ago. It's almost exactly a year ago, I think, that I started reading in the newspaper about um, this new outbreak. Mm -hmm. And it has been dominating our news and our lives for a year. Yeah. Um, how has the development of the vaccines gone compared to what your expectations were a year ago? Well, it's certainly been better than I expected. I mean, I, it's been faster than any other vaccine that has been developed. And in terms of effectiveness, it seems to be quite good. Um, of course, you know, it's a, it's a game against the virus right now for us to be able to vaccinate people before too many um, more severe variants emerge and spread within the community. So I think uh, it's a race, it's an arms race. <laughs> and so you need to get those vaccine in those arms and, and you know, help to get rid of the virus and prevent the emergence of more serious strains of the virus. Right. It's been a hard year, but it is, mm -hmm. it is very nice that we at least have some hope of moving forward even though it involves a lot of logistics and difficulties. But I, and I want to thank you for all the work that you've been doing. Oh, you're welcome. Um, on recommending vaccines and vaccine research and vaccine education. That's really valuable. I know that all of you at Japson and you yourself have been working around the clock for a very long time now. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're very happy to do whatever we can to help the community, um, provide them with the information they need to make good choices. And, you know, I encourage everyone to seriously consider getting vaccinated when it comes to their time. Me too. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. You're Dr. welcome. Dr. Chang, nice to see you. Yeah. And have a nice night. You too. Good night. Bye.